Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Um, thank you for passing by. If it's the first time you're passing by, welcome to my channel. You're welcome to subscribe, you're welcome to share, and you're welcome to interact with my subscribers. You're welcome even to leave a comment if you feel so inclined. And existing subscribers, thank you for your support, for logging in and listening to me. And um, new subscribers, thank you for showing interest. Now today, um, yeah, I want you all still to feel encouraged. I mean, now we're going to be talking a lot about the impact. I'm not going to be talking about the doom and gloom of, well, that is relative actually. But I want to kind of talk about the different, how it impacts different people differently and how it helps us to actually feel for other people. The shoe is on the other foot, especially for the middle class. The middle class, well, I shouldn't say the middle class, some of the middle class used to look down on the working class or anybody who was on the dole. They kind of felt as though they were better than them and some of them would even say they're whatless, you know, they don't have no ambition, they, um, you know, they're lazy, I'm sure you could get a job and maybe their accusations are founded. We won't know. The fact of the matter is, is that when you deal with DWP, the computers, you're not dealing with people, the computers do not know who is middle class, who is, well, you wouldn't be upper class if you were the DWP, but who is middle class and who is working class and who is uh, on the poverty line. It does not distinguish. It doesn't have a kind of a red, amber, green. Oh, if you were earning a certain amount or if you had a certain job, therefore you're going to get preferential treatment over any of the others. It doesn't work like that. The middle class, just like the working class, will have to join the queue. 110,000 claimants were queuing to apply for unemployment benefit on universal credit last night, according to Jeremy Corbyn. 110,000. They must have been on it waiting all night to get through. And then sometimes you get all the way through and you don't even have all the documents because you don't know. Well, to be honest, to be fair, they do tell you what documents you will need to have available in order to go forward. But remember I said in a previous video, I know it said, um, do you have a passport and do you have a driving license? Because you have a passport, it doesn't mean that you have it on you or it's immediately available. You could put it in. You could put it in a safe somewhere. And when, but when you're doing when you're doing the online application, at some point it it asks you all the questions about the passport. And if you don't have it, you have to start all over again. So it's not an easy process. And for people who are not used to um, a certain type of treatment or not used to not being, not feeling important, they're not feeling, they don't feel respected. They don't feel valued. It's, it's a huge drop from a pedestal, a very, very huge drop. This situation we are in now it is affecting the globe we're going to have an economy crash we're going to have millions out of jobs absolutely millions and the government with all their stipends and with all of what they uh, provisions they are putting through they will not come through fast enough to help the majority. Can you imagine trying to cater for 110,000 applicants when DWP couldn't cope with what they had on their books already? And even those people 
were waiting up to five, over five weeks in order to get their first payment. So can you imagine? They're not going to be able to cope. And then, so now, you know, why I titled it this way is because, you know, sometimes we do take a lot for granted. We assume we are in control of our destiny. We assume that if we work hard enough, we've paid our taxes, we've paid our national insurance, we have a little savings, we pay our bills on time. We, um, we're good citizens then. You know, we're not late payers. We kind of have our lives quite kind of organised and we assume that that is our passport to a hassle-free life. And then a situation like this comes that throws you totally off course. All of a sudden, people who had properties buying to let to buy or buy to rent, whichever one, whichever way you put it, their tenants can't pay the rent. And the government is telling the landlords to give them a rent break, to not charge them for rent for up to three months and to not evict them during a crisis. And yet the landlord is responsible for the mortgage. Mortgage of that house to that buy to let house property and the, the, his principal or her principal property. They then become responsible for both properties. And I remember when I... A few, well, I think it was about 15 years ago. I was going to do a buy to let. And I remember seeking advice and nobody would give me advice at the time. And I decided, I went to look at the property and I had all the mortgage in place. And it was only, a, it wasn't a house, it was just a little apartment. And I thought to myself, well, it could be a little, um, it could be like a retirement home. And I remember thinking, well, I had my own home and I would have that as my retirement home and then it would all be hunky-dory. And I remember going to look at that property. It was perfectly located. It was not too far from the station, near a bus stop, near a school, um, near a, um, what do you call it, the shops. Everything was far enough away but near enough, if you know what I mean. It was an excellent location. And I remember going to have a look at it. And it was quite nicely laid out. It would be ideal for one person. And I remember thinking to myself, I could smell damp. And I said to the person who was showing me around, I said, I can smell damp. And they said, well, you're going to have to damp proof this property because there's been some leaks or something. And I remember thinking to myself, no, nah, that's going to be too much work. I didn't think about that straight away. What came to my mind straight away was, supposing I can't get any tenants, would I be able to afford both mortgages? And of course, the answer was no. So that was what primarily turned me off. Despite when I did speak to some people, they were saying, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The tenants will pay the rent. But, you know, I told you in a previous video, I always think about the worst case scenario. I was still not convinced that I had to know, have peace within myself, that if, God forbid, I couldn't get no tenants or the tenants got laid off, I would be, a, I would be able to pay both. And the thing is that I didn't even know about interest only at that point. I only knew about, no, I must have known about interest only. Yeah, I think I did know about interest only. But the fact of the matter is, I couldn't afford both. So when I went to look at the property, because I was kind of weighing it up in my mind, when I went to look at the property and I could smell the damp, that is what kind of turned me off the decision altogether. And I didn't bother with the property. But this is, this is the reason why I mention that is because now today, in this current climate, you're going to have landlords 
who have their own principal property and they have buy to let property and the tenants can't pay the rent and the landlord is going to be responsible for that mortgage, albeit interest only. And if he, God forbid, is laid off, what's going to happen? And that's, that is the situation that's happening to a lot of the middle classes who, had, who were used to a certain standard of living. Some of them, if they worked it out right, worked it out properly, the house that they were renting would pay for, the rent would pay for that particular property, the interest on that particular property, and it would also pay the principal on the house that they were living in. So they had money more or less to burn. They could buy nice cars. They could live a reasonable life. They could go on holiday, knowing that they didn't have to worry too much. The tenant would take care of them. And that's just one example, because you have middle class people running businesses and all sorts. So what's happened now? It's like it's thrown everything on its head. Everything is just totally shut down. Totally shut down. And what are people meant to do? Soon the food banks, they're not going to be able to cope. Can you imagine moving from a situation where you are comfortable, where your children go to a decent school, where you have a nice home, to going to a food bank? I pray to God that the people, the middle class people, who they like to call us middle class because majority of us might have a property and they kind of term you as middle class. But it is very difficult to come to the realisation that you might not be able to, you haven't saved enough because you didn't prepare for this. You know, it's very, very hard. And then, you know, I kind of think to myself, oh my God, I bought a car, you know, use my money to buy a car, you, you kind of, do that and then you decide to buy something else and you kind of think oh yeah I'm going to save up again I'm going to accru- I'm going to spend this and then I'm going to start accruing again and then you and then this happens and you don't get a chance to accrue what do you do and you can never you know there's they've always got this um, advice that you should always have at least 6 months salary in your bank account how many people have got six months salary and the way this is going you're going to need more than six months salary to be honest but how many people have got six months salary to see them put down most people live from hand to mouth and i was listening to jerry corbyn and boris you know challenging boris johnson about what is going on with the world and talking about the people who, you know, the cleaners and all the lorry drivers and the dustbin men, and you know, the self-employed. And you're saying, you know, what are you doing for them? What are you going to do for them? They need money now. And Boris Johnson says, oh, yes, we're going to, we've got a package we're working on. We've got a package. The thing is with those upper classes and the rich, they do not have a clue about our lifestyle on the ground. They don't have a clue. And how can they have a clue? They've never been without. They've inherited from their parents, from their grandparents. They've always been given. They've always been provided for. They've always been fortunate enough to have a golden spoon in their mouth. There is no way they can understand that there are people out there who wait every week for their salary to come in so they can pay their bills. Or every month they're there waiting to get their salary so that they can pay their bills. He cannot. 
he cannot visualize that kind of lifestyle. He doesn't even know what Jer um, Corbyn is talking about. He's answering in a totally different way, in a way that you would talk to somebody who's got money put down and can, in a few weeks' time, access these funds he's talking about, this emergency fund he's talking about for the self-employed and for those people, the essential workers who look after his office, clean his office, and, you know, drive the buses, drive the trains and all that kind of stuff, and who have now been laid off. He cannot conceptualise what that is like. And none of, no rich person can. They would look on the poor as not managing their lives well, as not managing their finances well. And if they're at the bottom of the barrel, if they're homeless, if they're on the street, as far as they're concerned, they, their choices and their decisions have contributed to it. And he won't, he won't believe that the government should take on, should rescue these people who have made poor decisions and poor life choices. The fact that the impact of the coronavirus has exacerbated individuals' situations and circumstances, that is of no consequence as far as the rich or the, the, the politicians who cannot relate are concerned. They really cannot understand what all the fuss is about. We are putting 38 billion in the pot and businesses are going to do this. Does it matter that businesses are char charging 12% interest rates after the initial interest-free period is over? Can you imagine these businesses who are trying to get on their feet after the interest-free period is over and then being charged 12%? And that's the majority of banks. I think um, the Royal Bank of Scotland is the only one who's not, I think they're charging 6.75%. But Barclays and a lot of other banks, as soon as the interest period is over, it's jumping up to 12%. Can you imagine if mortgage interest on mortgage rates jump up like that? You know, it's, it's unthinkable. It is absolutely unthinkable. Now, have I moved away from the topic of this subject? I don't think so. Um... Like I said, DWP has reduced staff. They reduced staff because they were using computers. They didn't need to have so much staff. The computer was doing the work. They just need a few admin staff and the computer would do the rest. It was just like data inputting. So they're not geared up to accept this overflow. HMRC are not geared up to accept this overflow for the same reason. When you get more internet savvy, you need less humans. But when there's a disaster like this, that's when humans come in handy. And the sad thing is, is that when, whether it's the middle class, the working class, whoever they are, with all their distress and with all of their issues and problems and explanations and wanting to explain what is going on, what their situation is like, there is no one to talk to. The application is online. The decisions are online. If you have up to 6,000, you're allowed 6,000 savings. Um, but if you've got 16,000, they take a lot of deductions out of it. And you cannot negotiate with them. You can't tell them, OK, this 16,000 is my retirement fund. This 16,000 is for A, B, C, D and E. The machine is the, what is going to determine the outcome of your application. You cannot negotiate. And the machine will not see you come in in a three-piece suit or a tweed skirt and a nice blouse and tailored hairstyles and beautifully manicured nails. The computer is not going to see that. So regardless of who you are, you're all going to be treated the same which 
from as we hear from past experiences is quite abysmal. So, um, couples, they get £266 per week. Under 35s get £73 per week and they have to be in a joint um, bed sit or some kind of flat sharing to qualify. Um, £94 per week is sickness pay if you um, are off sick because of the virus. It's £94 a week. Um, what else can I say? Uh, the self-employed package, it looks like, I think it's rolling out today. I'm going to listen to it later. Oh, I think it's already started, actually. But apparently, from what I heard, initially, it's going to be paid to those who were paying P-A-Y-E pay as you earn and then depending on how much pay as you earn you paid in that is how much you get out something like that it's a bit like the personal allowance so i'm sorry that um i can't give you any more encouraging news really i'm once again i'm just sharing information um talking points from different aspects um you know, I don't want to hear how many more people are dying anymore. I don't want to hear all of this kind of stuff. I just want to give you some practical advice. So hopefully, if you know what you know, you might be able to get something from what I'm saying that can kind of trigger something that can enable you to do something to help your situation. I don't know what that might be, but I am just sharing information, hoping that the information I'm giving is of some use somehow. Keep the faith, peeps. God bless.